I, I witnessed the end of history when I watched the Asian Games and the Indian hockey team lost to China. I mean, I was devastated. I mean, when did the Chinese learn to play hockey? And India lost. So let's, let's do something about this. Very quickly, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I mean, India today invites me. I'm actually a nobody. So that's, uh, that's kind of nice. It gives me the privilege to be a bit honest. Um, uh, I can upset a few people and no one can take any retribution. Um, I can say a few things, hopefully politely. But I am a nobody and I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I'm going to keep this quite fairly straightforward. Uh, I'm not going to use the sort of parlance of uh, academic jargon to give credibility to simple thoughts. Um, so far too many simplistic notions of the world have been couched in academic terms and given credibility, and we are all guilty of giving this credibility. Uh, much of what I'm going to say is based on my little experience of life, uh, having traveled the world, lived in four or five continents, lived in many countries, and shared experiences with many people, Muslims included. Uh, I like to think uh, I'm a bit of an internationalist, and uh, my life has included many years in business. Uh, now I'm doing some uh, social work, uh, and you know, played a lot of sport, a bit of uh, a bit of music, etc. So a bit of everything. I'd like to share some of those uh, ideas with you. I'm not going to mention the T word. I'm not going to mention the W word, and I'm not going to mention that date in 2001, as though that changed everything. And I'm certainly not going to bash Muslims. So who am I? Very quickly, uh, I'm a citizen of the world. I was born in Malaysia, my, and the Indians here will know my parents came from, uh, from Kerala. They migrated to, to Malaysia, uh, not looking for democracy or modernization. Uh, they just went looking for work. Uh, my, my mother was a nine-year-old who followed her brothers, and my father was a 20-year-old who knew her brothers. Um, I had a multicultural background. I'm not worried of men with beards and turbans when I see them in airports worrying about things. Um, I was brought up in a Hindu home, and the Hindus here will know that means we lit the lamp at 7 o'clock, we said our prayers. I didn't know what we were saying. We were all saying Sanskrit. I didn't understand. Then I went to school, and the brothers said, Our fathers who are in heaven and all of that. I was completely confused. And then at home, or when, when I was going home at about 12 o'clock, we sneaked into the mosque because the mullah there has some very good sweets, and we all had sweets. And we thought, hey, these guys are good. And then we'd go home, and in the evenings, we'd go to the Chinese shops and eat pork buns, steamed ones. So we were multicultural. And that's the story that I think I want to tell you in my view of the world. So what is history, really? Uh, I think we can all have uh, various definitions of what history is um, and, and argue about it. My, my favorite is to take two bits of uh, definitions. I think Voltaire said it's fables agreed. And I think Winston Churchill said something about it's the victor's story. My definition is the victor's fables all agreed. It's not our version. That's why it's called his story. This version ain't mine. Uh, but I hope you do not think that's trivial because it's actually quite important. But history has always been written by others. How many history books about India that are standard texts in the, in the universities of the world were actually written by Indians? I'm trying to do a bit of research to find out, but I was with the general counsel, uh, the council general of India in Hong Kong, and he was over dinner and he said, you know, there's no such books. How many Indians actually know, or, or, his, or people internationally know of Chandra, Chandra, uh, Chandra Bose? How many know that he said, give me blood and I'll give you freedom? So history has always been written by others, not by us. And Indian history is interestingly one that I'm fascinated. All the best books are apparently written by foreigners with their own version of what took place here. Atrocities sort of slightly, you know, uh, muddled over, things like that. How many Indians even know the amount of Indians who died serving the Raj in the Second World War? Every time that they commemorate the Second World War in Europe, I'm astonished that none of the Indians say, hey, we paid a heavy price too. So there are many examples of distortion of this history. I mean, the Vietnamese version of what happened in Vietnam has not been written by the Vietnamese yet. What happened in Algeria has not been written by Algerians. And what's happened in Iran, Iran in 1953, when democracy was hijacked by oil interests, happening again today, was not written. And no one has told the Australian and indigenous, uh, indigenous Australians how to write their history. So when we talk about the end of history, it really boils down to who you are, what were you as the world you have, what are the ideological pursuits you follow, and who your masters are. Academic solutions 
cooked up in the isolation of Washington, London, Rome, do not make foreign policy. They are not the policies for the rest of the world. Op-eds in the Financial Times should not turn into foreign policy. So a lot of what has been said about the end of history, etc., and I'm not just challenging Dr. Fukuyama here, uh, who I respect enormously, but in the interest of some intellectual provocation, really have defined narrow views of the world. Which direction your telescope is pointed is what I view, how people interpret these things, and what ideologies you seek to further, depending who your masters are, and what academic credentials you seek to burnish. But it also depends on how arrogant you are in terms of not acknowledging what you don't know. I've always been fascinated by how people who speak one language, who never had a passport, uh, just got one when they're about 60 years old, travel around the world and tell us who's free and who's not free. I've always been fascinated by those who talk about Islam when they don't have many, any Muslim friends. So the basic principle is, in my view, one of fundamentalism on all sides. One that seeks to divide people into simplistic notions of good and evil. And we all know these are the musings of people riddled with intolerance, poor understanding, and steeped in lacking wisdom and a severe lack of generosity of spirit. It's also intellectually dishonest and intellectually lazy. The scriptures of extremism have been, have been written, and too many find it easier to follow them than to think. So the end of history would mean very different things to different people. I was brought up as a kid in Malaysia where we were told that John Wayne was going to save us because they were going to fight the Viet Cong and win. Until some black guy in the United States called Muhammad Ali appeared on TV with my first images and said, I got nothing against the yellow man. I said, hey, what's wrong with this guy? You know, uh, I got nothing. So we began to think differently. But in terms of the end of history, if you were Vietnamese in the 1980s, you saw things very different in terms of what history and what the future was going to promise, if you were Indian, things looked pretty hopeless in the 70s and 80s. If you're Iraqi today, it is the end of history. And similarly in South Africa, where I lived uh, in Southern Africa in the, in the late, in the mid 80s, things looked very bleak. If you're a black African, you thought, hey, the white man's always going to be in charge. So our view of the world is tempered by our experiences and the ideological rings we draw around us. And the world did not revolve around the U.S.'s struggle with the USSR. And that's what the end of history sort of ideology seems to suggest, that once the wall came down and the USSR was broken up, then we have won. None of that recognized the non-aligned movement, the heroes of that, some of my heroes, Nasser, Nehru, all of Kenyatta, Nkrumah, all of those people, Ho Chi Minh, none of that recognized that. None of that even recognized that 1.5 billion Indians and Chinese in the year 2005 may want to join the world as equals and say, hey, we're coming. None of the world recognized what that would mean. But the question is, how did we allow these naive notions about the world gain intellectual respectability? and influence policies amongst those who saw them as the guardians of all things important in the world. There are many reasons for these. First, we, I mean those who were either colonized, silent, underdeveloped, we kept silent. Reasons for that, colonialism, backwardness, lack of education, lack of access to the powers of the corridors of power. We do not have the confidence, nor the financial resources to have a place at the table. This is still very much the case, despite our efforts to buy up steel plants and, uh, and, uh, and, and things like that. We felt inferior. We did not build the institutions that were needed, and I agree totally with Francis there. We don't have strong institutions. We need to build those. We had no access to the publishing houses that would take our serious thoughts and put them out there. We had no access to the media. Still the same. Our priorities were different, though and their priorities in India continue to be there. Our priorities were, how do we feed a billion people? Our best and brightest sought intellectual legitimacy in Western institutions. If you went to Harvard, you were king. But if you went to the University of Rawalpindi or Trivandrum, who cared? 
Cambridge, Oxford and Harvard were the places to go and we were subservient and thought that's where we needed to do, go. I never heard of Harvard until I was 30. In the great scheme of things, these institutions of the West, which have clearly provided a lot of provocation and thought for us, are actually quite meaningless. But we continue to give them the praise that they, I don't believe, deserve. That doesn't mean I don't think they do good work. We continue to pay homage. We have dared not question the legitimacy in trying to shape our world. We therefore continue to neglect our own needs with inferior sentiments. And then there is that all-important tyranny of English. If you don't speak English, you don't have a platform. How many Japanese business leaders do you know who can stand up in a forum like this and speak to all of you? How many Chinese do you know? Indians, I know many. But you know if you speak with a strong Indian accent, no one's going to take you seriously. So I put it on too. I can get down, speak very Indian, go to Malaysia, speak Malaysian English, go to Singapore, speak English, and go to Africa and be the brothers and be a bit African. But when I come here, I have to speak a bit posh. Because if I don't, no one takes me seriously. So the tyranny of English has also been very important. So uh, this is important. But this has much been the case till now. And so very few of us are prepared to challenge this because we need acceptance in the international arena. Very few of us are bold enough. As I started up my little think tank, I've been to some of the, be you know, the, the, the tycoons of Hong Kong who all privately say to me, Chandran, this is good. Do what you're doing. We all support you. I say, hey, can you stand up and say these things? Hey, sorry, because you know, I might not get support in the, in the business arena. Why are, we, why are you supporting these sorts of uh, more independent voices? So, we the internationalists have failed. I mean by the internationalists, those of us who understand our pan from our naan, our dobi from our wala, our miso soup from our sashimi, our tom yam kung from our pad thai, our ravioli from our pasta, those of us who travel, those who lived in different cultures, we have failed. And my view is that it's time for us to stand up. We need to contribute, we have to have thoughts. We need to articulate what we believe. We have passports. We have traveled. I'm always fascinated in Hong Kong, where I've lived for the past 20 years, but traveled and worked in many parts of the world, that every year we have a ritual when the Heritage Foundation, if I'm impolite, I say a bunch of rednecks, turn up in Hong Kong and tell us who's free. These are guys who know so little about the world. They speak one language. They never lived outside the USA. And they come and tell us who's free. And we never challenge them. We, those of us in Asia, the developing world, who have lived, experienced the world, who come with long histories, who have the wind of our past blowing in our ears, we have been asleep at the wheel. And let us be frank, because our colonial histories, many of us feel we are still being treated as such, even in the global economy. After all, didn't everyone in India here feel a sense of great pride and feel a sense of payback when Ratan Tata and his group bought an Anglo-Dutch company. Indian, the, the, the Indian media was flush with this sort of nationalism. And how many of us noticed the disproportionate publicity given when more than 250 Indians died one week in 2006, one week after the anniversary of the London bombings? How many noticed that the BBC, the CNN, had five days of coverage and when the Indians died, that was like one day of vague uh, reporting on it. Why? Because don't they all die all the time? Just like the Iraqis. And how many of us do not feel, and I travel the world all the time, that the war in Iraq has huge undertones of racism in it, but it's never featured in any, any serious intellectual discussion about the war. So, we still hold those resentments, and I believe it's a time that many of our business leaders find the vocabulary, the courage, and the intellectual strength to talk about these things so that they don't get dismissed as lefties. No one can claim that I'm a lefty. I have, I like to think, a fairly good business record. I love money. And, uh, you know, I'm not here for seeking revolution. But we have ourselves to blame. We have ceded intellectual thought leadership to the West. And this is dangerous. We have copped out, tuned out, asleep at the wheel, we've gone home. Bullied, we have confidently slipped into just wanting to fit into the economic models established by the post-Second World era. 
I know the World Economic Forum is the place where the Indian IT gurus and the wealthy are now all invited. Ten years ago, hey, we don't wonder the Indians. Today they're all there, Bollywood and everything. And we just play by the rules. Good. But we need to create something more than this. We have been seduced, but it's time that we start to engage. But the world needs us, needs us to engage. Even America needs us, despite its exceptionalism. America needs us more than it needs our foreign reserves. America needs us to help itself. Because if we don't speak up, those who live in the ivory towers of Washington will have such a distorted view of the world, which we've all seen, and not be helped. We can help them. We can help them by telling them the world is a lot more complex place. And some of us live in that world. Some of us have experienced that world. And we can save America from its exceptionalism. I will not bash Muslims because if I do, then I have to go and bash the evangelists in, in the USA. And I don't want to go there. But if any of you have seen the Borat movie, the scariest bit in that movie was when Borat hadn't do, hadn't, didn't have to do anything. He went into one of those, uh, one of those auditoriums with about 60,000 evangelists. It's scary. Go and watch that. Just that sequence. So the world needs our wider perspectives. It needs our understanding our aspirations, and we need to feed into the melting pot of really nice, good masala. We do not need to be told that the world is flat, because Thomas Friedman came here for a week, met his IT friends, and ate some flat dosa. Would his worldview be different if he had some Italy for breakfast? But what happens? You know, the guys in the White House read this, hey, Thomas Friedman's got it right. And, this, and all the Indians I meet say, my God, what a lot of crap. I say, where are your book? Where are you talking about these things? So, where are our viewpoints when we to contribute to the global discourse? If it remains silent, then the ideologies of the right and, our, and Western imperial viewpoints, I'm not anti-Western, by the way, will, will hijack our world. We need to fight back, but with ideas. I'm not going to even use the, G, the, the J word. Our knowledge, our experience, our internationalism. Bring our backwardness, some of our knowledge, and, and engage. But stop feeling inferior. So what's the new world going to look like very quickly? The whole new world, in my view, will need to take care of through six problems. First, and as a point raised this morning, historical injustices. Historical injustices continue to haunt us. We need to draw a line around some of these things, under, under these things. But we need new players to resolve. And I see Tony Black going around the Middle East saying peace. It's like asking the arsonist to put the fire out. You can't. We need new players. But things are happening. The Saudis are brokering some peace. The Chinese are beginning to get involved. And I wish the United States would stay out of the Middle East. The other one, uh, the other, and historical injustices will include the Iraq war. Until a line is drawn and someone says, something wrong happened here. Now, I'm staggered by the amount of people who call it a misadventure. Half a million people dead, a misadventure? Foreign policy misadventure? The Iraq war, unless someone says, something wrong, we're here, something, uh, a crime was committed, we will see generations of conflict arising from this. Second problem. And the Japanese-Chinese conflict at the moment keeps going on. Second problem, unfair trade practices. And I know that, you know, the Indian uh, Minister of Trade and Commerce will be speaking later. And Doha, I always am interested. It's never spoken about in China. I spent a lot of time in China. You know, you never hear of Doha because the Chinese aren't interested. They're saying time out. And the Brazilians and the Indians are saying, sorry, new rules. So the second one, the unequal distribution of wealth, a time bomb in our region. I think the ADB two months ago said that the seeds of mutual destruction are actually being sown at the moment in China and India with a huge disparity in, in wealth. Third point, fourth point, poor governance. I think many of us in Asia and the developing world cannot stand up and say that we have instituted strong governance, weak institutions. Fifth one, religious intolerance on all sides. Those of us who are free thinkers, not caught up in this clash, or whatever you want to call it, I'm, I'm, I just don't want to get in, dragged into this. Please, my world is not shaped by 
what Christians, Judeo-Christianity and Islam thinks of itself, thinks of each other. And the last and most important brave new world thing is humanity's ecological imp impact, from climate change to the destruction of natural systems around the world. This is one of the biggest things that I, I feel will change the world. And we are not equipped to do this. Okay, so I'd like to finish by just saying that unless we get prepared for the brand new world in which Indians and Chinese and others from Africa are going to join as equals, we have not really understood what, what is happening in the world. Secondly, dealing with scarcity is going to be one of the greatest geopolitical issues of the world. And that, in my, my, my world, uh, my view, will define the way nations work together. And I'd like to end up by saying that in the business world, I like to see Asian companies become more global, but behave responsibly. And that will be the test for, for many of us. I like to see the investment banks become Asian too, not the cartel that we have. The accounting firms become more global and not the cartel that we have. My final point, and I'll finish off. I was reading the Financial Times yesterday, and the chairman of KPMG said, this great nation of India will be held back in its development because it will not open its doors to the global cartel of accounting firms. I mean, how much hubris can you take in a day? So I'll finish by saying that we need to challenge all of this nonsense. Let's hope that in, in Asia, we, in, in the developing world, as we create our new world, we will strengthen civil society. We'll have think tanks in this part of the world that will challenge the nonsense emanating from the neoconservatives and others. And we will build stronger institutions of learning and governance. And uh, I'd like to just end by saying the last thing is we need media. And Al Jazeera now is in Asia. I was in the studios on Friday. We need media. So before we, Indians, Chinese buy more steel companies and chemical companies, can we just create an Asian media group that is powerful so that we have greater diversity of opinions and we are not all seduced by what CNN and BBC have to say. Thank you very much. I think it is indeed a hopeful sign for the world that Chandran and Francis Fukuyama can actually agree on a lot of where we want to go, even if they disagree about how we actually get there. Um, but uh, time is running out, but we would like to stay, take some questions very quickly uh, from the floor. May I request you to be very brief and pointed, and we'll collect perhaps three questions and then give the panelists some chance. Mr. Kampani. Francis, you talk about the China. I would like to ask a question that uh, India has gone through a very strong democracy route in the last 60 years. China, we don't know what it is. It's communist capitalism. But as you rightly said, that when the people are growing, income are growing, what will happen to China? Because when the wealth comes to person, he wants freedom. And he wants freedom of speech. And when the freedom of speech and freedom of press comes in, will China have to go through what India has gone through for the last 60 years of democratic institution? And will they affect Asia? What are your views on that? In the interest of time, may I propose that we just collect two or three questions and then just give you each of you a sort of last sentence, as it were. Anyone? Yeah, Mr. Trivedi. Dinesh Trivedi, Member of Parliament. I'll ask a very quick question to Francis. Do you think they're using this word Islamic fundamentalist and jihad very loosely without really understanding what it means and by doing that, we are actually helping the guys who have the evil design to come together in the world. Thank you. Any other questions? If, yes, gentlemen here, please. Thank you. Sir, I'm J.C. Monty. I'm an officer of the Indian Administrative Service. My question is there, sir. Sir, you just mentioned that good governance can come only within the context of liberal democracy. And, but in the Indian context, the widely held view is that that the root cause of misrule and many other evils of government 
is coming because of our majoritarian democratic politics and secondly more, most often we hear that the captains of industry they quote that china is a greater player and a more efficient player in the global economic scenario because it has a communist kind of a government so what should we do is it a kind of a temporary phase i will just quickly say next question that get uh, sir mentioned that you have to reinvent this architecture etc so, so do you think the new international economic order ex experiment of willie brand's time is still relevant today thank you okay i am afraid uh, we have to say end the session on time so i'll request uh, fukuyama to begin first and then maybe if you want to add another <coughs> All right, well thank you for those uh, questions on the on the question about China uh I obviously don't know what is going to happen in China's future uh I do know that there will be a uh, pressure I think for greater uh, participation and recognition uh of uh, citizens and accountability uh in that country but the specific form that that accountability takes uh I think will be up to the chinese to to determine themselves and it will be probably a set of institutions that will be uh, very uniquely tailored to the particular traditions that uh, china uh, has experienced if you look at democracy that has developed in other asian countries in japan in taiwan in south korea they don't really look like american democracy they don't look like european democracy they uh, really i think are fundamentally de democratic in the end product but the specific institutional form i think is um uh, is tailored to everyone's own historical experience and i think that's uh, necessary and a good thing uh on the question of um of the terminology uh, about islamic islamist uh, extremism uh, i hope mr nayer does not think i was bashing muslims and in fact at lunch yesterday um Uh, Mr. Katsumi said that he actually read the article on which my little uh, I had uh, taken what I said today uh, uh, from a larger article uh, that Mr. Katsumi actually said he agreed with uh, as to the origins of the extremism that we see before us. The terminology, I think, is extremely uh, important because you really are talking about certain very minority positions within the larger world of Islam, and one of the big dangers is tarring. you know the entire civilization or the entire religion with uh, what is uh, clearly a minority position uh, and so we can discuss you know what the right words to use for that are but uh, i at least want to make that clear on the question of governance it's a very good point you do not have to have democracy to have good governance uh, i think one of the characteristics of a lot of the east asian fast developers was that they had authoritarian governments that were democ that were developmentally oriented uh that had a high degree of technocratic uh capability uh that could keep corruption uh within um uh certain limits uh and therefore promote long-term rapid development but i also think it's the case that past a certain point you cannot get good governance unless you have basic accountability because every authoritarian system eventually screws up and unless you have a mechanism to correct those mistakes uh you're you're not going to have a good government in the long run and so therefore i think that there is in the end a certain connection uh not permanent and not it it doesn't apply at all times but i do think that democracy uh does have an important role in eventually producing good governance thank you and then briefly just very quick oops Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Just very quickly about China. I mean, I, I, I've been going to China for 20 years. Uh, I go there almost every other week, and I have to tell you that something very, very unique is happening there. I, I meet Chinese from all walks of life. I work in some of the villages too, and there is accountability of a different nature. And very few of my Chinese friends talk about democracy. Second point. Uh, I think the language is very important. The more we keep using these loaded terms. the more people will get angry and i think we need to be very careful that's why i didn't use the t word the j word the w word etc language is very important it provokes emotional response and too many have used language so cheaply without understanding the implications of how uh, of the consequences of they've used it uh, secondly on good governance i challenge my indian friends and i've written a piece about this you know when it comes to institutions of delivering what people need perhaps india has failed when people can't you have toilets in india 
and in China, they have solved that problem. I mean, which institutions do you want? And I would say that, you know, the institutions in China, perhaps, and I think that's the point that was being made, perhaps are working a bit better than they are in India. Thank you. Okay. Um, on that note, I'm afraid uh, we have to bring this session to a close because it is uh, almost 12.15. Uh, I think one of the big points that I think is worth taking away from this session, uh, this very, very rich session, is the fact that in part what the future look like, look, looks like will be determined by the stories we tell about it and who gets to tell those stories. And I think one of the interesting uh, things about the juncture that we are is that the intellectual, the political, and the global space for bringing in different kinds of stories has opened up in an unprecedented kind of way. And in that sense, conclaves like this and what India Today has organized, uh, we hope will be a catalyst for just that kind of conversation. So may I now invite Mr. Uh, Arun Puri to uh, present a memento to our speakers.